Ho! How's it going, everybody? Welcome to D&D Optimized, part of the D4 network. This is the show where each week we take a deep dive into one, sometimes two, specific character builds for Dungeons & Dragons 5e. Um, not to tell you the best or only or right way to play them, but to just theorycraft about a character and crunch numbers and uh, try to build a character that's both really fun to play in game and also really powerful. So if you enjoy creating characters for D&D almost as much as playing the game or you're looking for tips on playing a particular character that you have in mind, then welcome home. This is where you belong. And I am super happy to have you, so thanks for being here. My name's Colby, and I will be your host. Before we jump into the build this week, if you would like to have a written step-by-step -step guide to this and all of my other builds. I hope that you would consider joining the channel as a member. There's a little button down there in the corner somewhere for you to click on. For $2 a month, you get access to like my library of write-ups, which I create for each episode. So you could have a step-by-step -step guide to recreate the character yourself if you would like to. More importantly, I think, um, and for a lot of my members, frankly, it's just a great way to support the channel and uh, help me create more and better content. So thank you for considering doing so. And regardless, thanks for being here. Thanks for watching. Thanks for liking and subscribing. All those things are also great ways to support the channel. So thank you. You guys want to hear a funny story? Okay, good. So when I started creating the character build for this week, I initially started out uh, doing a fighter rogue multi-class build. It's one that I had had on my to-do list for quite some time. I've been looking forward to doing it for a while. I got to a place in the script where the core of the build felt pretty complete, and so I was considering adding some Paladin level, specifically Oath of Vengeance Paladin, to shore up a couple of things that I felt that the build was missing that could have made it uh, more powerful. The problem that I ran into was once I started, I couldn't stop taking Oath of Vengeance Paladin levels. <laughs> there was always some strong feature that was just a couple levels away every time I thought about stopping and maybe going back to Rogue or whatever. So I would take a couple more, and then I would take a couple more, and then pretty soon I no longer had a Rogue Fighter build. I had an Oath of Vengeance Paladin build with a little bit of Rogue and Fighter multi-class dip. And after a bunch of number crunching and reworking, I just realized that the character would be better off if I just started off as a paladin with the Oath of Vengeance. <laughs> so at like midnight, two nights ago, I shelved the rogue fighter character and have been working ever since to put this character build together that is basically an Oath of Vengeance paladin. It's just, it's the subclass that keeps on giving. Or perhaps more accurately, I think between the really strong subclass features and the already amazing paladin chassis features, it is maybe the toughest subclass to multi-class out of in D&D, with, with maybe one or two exceptions, because there's just, there's always something really nice on the horizon with an Oath of Vengeance paladin. And to be honest, I think that's kind of the exception to the rule in 5th edition. I mean, obviously, or else I wouldn't multi-class my build so much, right? I mean, don't get me wrong. There are often great reasons to stick with a particular subclass for the duration of that character's career. But more often than not, I think, classes and subclasses in D&D 5e tend to be pretty front-loaded in their power. Or at least maybe the really strong ones do, the strongest ones. And I think classes and subclasses that have good, attractive, strong features from levels 1 all the way through level 20 are fairly few and far between in 5e. That said, I, this is not necessarily a criticism. I actually like that so many subclasses get strong, attractive features early because it creates interesting, compelling reasons, I think, to look at like other classes as options for your character weigh them against the benefits of staying with your current class, and that then opens the door wide open for a lot of fun, unique combos that, as most of my longtime viewers know by now, 
I really love trying to put together. That, that puzzle solving aspect almost of character creation is one of my favorite things. But I, I will admit, I do kind of hope that when Wizards of the Coast comes out with their next iteration of D&D, you know, 5.5 or whatever it is that they've recently announced that's coming out in 2024, um, and we talked about that news in a slide into my DMs episode there. I hope that when they do that, they they create more subclasses or maybe refine more subclasses to be more like the Oath of Vengeance Paladin. It's not that it's the perfect subclass necessarily or the most powerful subclass in 5e. I think it's it's up there. I don't know that I would say it's like the best or the strongest. I don't know that that exists, but regardless, it is a great example of how to have a character that has good, compelling features throughout the character's lifespan. And not just great stuff at the beginning, but largely like forgettable stuff later. Or worse, mediocre stuff at the beginning, even if there's still like some really compelling great things later on. <laughs> Especially because so few of us actually play the game at later levels in the first place, right? So what's the point of having an amazing feature at character level 17 when the stuff before that is just kind of okay or not very good? All this is not to say, of course, that even the Vengeance Paladin couldn't potentially benefit from a little multi-classing, depending on how you wanted to build them and what you were going for with your build. I am going to do some in the episode today, but it will be less than I think most of my builds. I just think that multi-classing out of Oath of Vengeance is a tougher decision. And I actually really like that. I like those difficult decisions where it's like, oh, I, I, both options are good, which is better. Let's try and figure it out. That's what I want more of in D&D. And so, yes, Today, we are creating an Oath of Vengeance Paladin, which is a character, of course, I think, like most Paladins, I suppose, that really lends itself well to a burst damage focus or a Nova damage focus. And so that will be the focus of the character today, creating a character who can, with the assistance of their limited expendable powerful resources pump out some really big damage if a limited number of times per rest as opposed to sustained damage builds right that are that are low resource intensive so as to eliminate one or more enemies early on in a fight to tip the odds of that fight in your party's favor and boy can vengeance pallies do that and so Without any further ado, I proudly present episode 63, The Oath of Vengeance Paladin. Let's jump in. All right, at level one, for our class, we're actually starting Paladin this week. <laughs> Can you believe it? I'm, uh, I'm not giving you any bait and switch. The Paladin chassis just has so much going for it that I don't want to delay all of the great goodies that we can get, uh, especially in the first few levels. Now, as for our race, I am going to recommend that we go variant human with this build. We really, really want two feats. And if one of those feats were a half feat, meaning, right, that you get a plus one to an important ability score and some additional benefits from a feat, then we'd probably go custom lineage to get a plus two to that really important stat and then a plus one so that we could start with an 18 in our most important stat. I do this very often, as some of you like to criticize me for. <laughs> with this character, neither of the feats that I want are half feats and paladins are notoriously multiple ability score dependent mad we really want two actually three uh, ability scores high as possible so anyway i want to start with variant human as it lets us start with a 16 in our two most important abilities and that's really nice for us and later actually your entire party as for the free feat that we would be taking here at level one i will recommend going polar master it's been a minute, actually, since I've done a Polar Master build. Uh, ten episodes, in fact, the Fey Wanderer. Although they were actually using a quarter staff, not an actual like glaive or halberd that we would think of as a typical polearm. But anyway, Polar Master is a fantastic feat. It's very strong. It lets you take an opportunity attack when an enemy enters your reach, not just leaves your reach, right? And remember, your reach with a polearm, assuming that you're using a halberd or a glaive or a pike, is 10 feet as opposed to the usual five. So that already is nice. Most important for us, when we make an attack with a polearm, 
we get to make an attack with the blunt end of the weapon, or the butt of the weapon, as I like to call it, as a bonus action, and that attack does a d4 of damage as opposed to like the d10. Again, I'm assuming that you're using a halberd or a glaive, right? So it's a d10 and then a d4 bonus action with the butt of the weapon. In case you didn't know, the reason why that's nice, in addition to the fact that it's a weaponized bonus action, is that because you're using the same weapon as you're using for your attack action attack, uh, you can still add your ability score modifier to the attack, unlike when you are dual wielding light weapons, for example, unless you take the two weapon fighting style. Anyway, there is an alternative to creating the Vengeance Paladin build uh, that does not use a polearm. Um, it's fairly popular among Vengeance Paladin lovers. Uh, it uses a double-bladed scimitar. I think it's a great option in certain situations and with some caveats. So if you're interested in hearing about that alternate path, stay tuned. In the final thoughts of the build at the end, I will go over briefly what that looks like and how it differs. As for our equipment, it's pretty standard stuff. Um, you know, make sure you have some chain mail, grab a halberd or a glaive for your martial weapon. I prefer the glaive, but it's basically, do you want a sword on a stick or an ax on a stick? And everything else that a paladin may need. As for our ability scores, I always assume that we're using the point by method. And so with that assumption, I recommend that we go with a 15 strength and take one of our plus ones there to get us 16. A 15 charisma with another plus one there. So we've got a 16 in strength and charisma and then a 14 constitution. After that, at level one, paladins get the divine sense ability, which lets you as an action, basically try to detect fiends, celestials, or undead within 60 feet of you that are not behind total cover. You can do this one plus your charisma modifier times per day, so that's four times a day for us. And it's, a, it's an okay little utility feature um, that will come in handy once in a while. We also, of course, get the Lay on Hands feature as a Paladin at level one, which basically gives us five points per Paladin level that go into our pool of Lay on Hands points. And then as an action, we can use as many of those points as we want that are available to us to heal ourselves or an ally with a touch, one hit point of healing per point in our Lay on Hands pool that we have. We can also spend five points to cure a disease or a poison. And that's level one. At level two, paladins get a fighting style. And while I'm tempted to take the great weapon fighting style, because we are, after all, optimizing for damage with this build, the reality is the great weapon fighting style is just not very good. It lets you reroll ones and twos when you do damage with a weapon that you're using two hands to attack with. And statistically speaking, numerically speaking, it's just very small. I'm going to make a rare suggestion for me that with as weak as it is, and because we don't have a shield, and we don't have constitution saving throw proficiency because we started paladin, not getting hit on this character is even a little more important than it otherwise would be. So I want to take the defense fighting style here, which simply bumps our armor class by one if we're wearing armor. I think it's just the better choice for this character personally. And then of course we get paladin spells at level two here. Paladins generally have a fairly small spell list compared to other casters, but there are some really potent ones. There are some fun smite spells for extra damage and conditions, um, some good defensive and support type options. I'd be sure to grab cure wounds for a heal in a pinch when you're out of lay on hands points anyway, but the one that I would really ensure that you get and that I'd focus on here is the bless spell. It's one of the best buff spells in the game, and it just it stays strong from level 1 to level 20. To cast the spell, you use your action, it requires your concentration, and thereafter for one minute, you and up to two others that you cast it on, I'm going to assume you're using it on yourself, you get to add a d4 to all of your attack rolls and to your saving throws. Now we do get a bonus to our saving throws, including our constitution saving throw, that will be helpful so that we don't drop concentration on bless. Bless is such a self-serving spell. So selfish. And then, of course, at level two, paladins get the divine smite feature. Uh, you know it, you love it. So when you hit an enemy with the melee attack, you can spend a spell slot to add 2d8 radiant damage 
to that attack. It scales an extra 1d8 per additional spell level that you use, all the way up to fourth level spells where it caps at a 5d8. And of course, it does an additional 1d8 of damage to undead and fiends. We, of course, will be making lots of use of this. At level 3, we get the Divine Health feature, which tells us that we are now immune to disease. So that's nice when you get diseased. I don't know about you guys. I, I can probably count on one hand all the times that my character has been subjected to a disease in a game of D&D, but maybe my DMs are just very health conscious people. And then, of course, we get our Sacred Oath, our subclass. And we are, as I've said, going with the Oath of Vengeance. Here's what we read about the Oath of Vengeance Paladin. The Oath of Vengeance is a solemn commitment to punish those who have committed a grievous sin. When evil forces slaughter helpless villagers, when an entire people turns against the will of the gods, when a thieves' guild grows too violent and powerful, when a dragon rampages through the countryside, at times like these, Paladins arise and swear an oath of vengeance to set right that which has gone wrong. To these paladins, sometimes called avengers or dark knights, their own purity is not as important as delivering justice. So, if you've ever wanted to play an avenger in D&D, here's your chance. So, of course, this goes without saying, but naturally, you're going to want to work this into your backstory, I think, somehow. This moment, this trigger that caused you to swear this oath. I want to know what happened to you as a character that led you down this path. Or even maybe ideally, I would hope that if you're playing this character with this oath, it would like get worked into the actual gameplay at some point, maybe right before you hit level three, where something cool and tragic happens in the game causing you to take up this oath. I'd love to know if any of you have great stories on an Oath of Vengeance Paladin that you've played. What caused you to swear that oath and what vengeance was it that you were seeking? Regardless, definitely discuss this with your dungeon master and of course, you know, give them an opportunity to create like an awesome story moment for you and for your friends at the table by giving your character motivation to seek vengeance. So regardless of the oath that paladins take, when they take their oath, they get a number of oath spells. They're always prepared. And the oath spells for the Oath of Vengeance Paladin are, in my opinion anyway, the best among all paladin subclasses. At this level, at level three, you get Bane and Hunter's Mark. Those are good. I would say not great necessarily. I, I wouldn't use either, I don't think, for my concentration uh, over Bless personally, although both have their uses. Later on, I think I will take an oath spell as my concentration, but not yet. And also, like all paladins, we get channel divinity here at level three, which we can use once per short rest. Each oath gets two options for their channel divinity. The first for the vengeance paladin is abjure enemy, which lets us as an action force a wisdom save on an enemy within 60 feet, or they are frightened of us. That frightened condition lasts for one minute, which means that they have disadvantage on attack rolls and ability checks while they can see us and they cannot willingly move closer to us either. Not only that, but their speed is zero anyway, so they also couldn't move away from us. <laughs> and the really nice thing about Abjure Enemy is that it, they do not get to make saving throws on subsequent turns if they fail that initial one, so it's really a very strong fear. But an even better use of our Channel Divinity, for our purposes I think anyway, is the second option for Channel Divinity that Oath of Vengeance Paladins get, which is Vow of Enmity. The way this works is you use it as a bonus action on one creature within 10 feet, and thereafter all of our attack rolls have advantage against that creature for one minute or until they die or go unconscious. There are, of course, a lot of ways to gain advantage in Dungeons & Dragons, but this one is particularly good, I think, due to the fact that the enemy doesn't get to make a save, and there are no other conditions that need to be met as a prerequisite. You just use your bonus action, and now you have advantage on this enemy. It is only one enemy per short rest, essentially. That is a bummer, but it makes for a very strong Nova round for us. At level four, we get our first ability score increase or feat. And of course, yes, we're gonna go with the Great Weapon Master feat here. This feat tells us that 
attacks we make with heavy weapons, and yes, glaives and halberds are heavy, get a plus 10 bonus to their damage at a penalty of minus five to hit. This just adds so much damage for our character, it's very hard to pass up, and even though that minus five to hit really hurts, it is somewhat mitigated by our bless spell and by the advantage that we get, at least during our Nova round, allowing us to keep the Great Weapon Master feature like turned on at a higher enemy armor class than would otherwise be advisable. Don't forget, too, the other feature that comes with the Great Weapon Master feat. If you score a critical hit with a melee weapon or reduce an enemy to zero hit points with one, then you can make another attack as a bonus action. Now, thanks to Polar Master, we are already doing that, but again, it's with the butt, and so it's only a d4 as opposed to a d10 that you would be granted on a critical hit or reducing an enemy to zero. So keep that in mind. At level five, we get extra attack, which means we can make two attacks when we take the attack action, and two is more than one, so that's good. And then we do get second level paladin spells as well. First up, that means you can smite for more damage now if you were to expend a second level spell slot. You'd get 3d8 of damage by doing so, and you can upcast bless to cover one additional party member with the bless spell, so that could be advisable depending on your party. There are lots of great second level paladin spells, aid for extra hit points for you and or your allies, find steed of course for a free and very powerful mount, but my favorite choices here actually are our oath spells. We get hold person and misty step. They are both fantastic, neither that are available to paladins typically. Misty step of course provides great movement and teleportation as a bonus action, and hold person is potentially devastating to humanoids as we explored at great length in the Critlander episode, if you have not seen that. With hold person, if your enemy fails their wisdom save against you, they are paralyzed, meaning attacks against them that are made from within five feet are automatic critical hits among other things and yes if you smite when you crit then the smite damage is doubled too so needless to say if you're fighting a humanoid and especially if you think there's a decent chance that they're going to fail their wisdom saving throw this could be potentially devastating just keep in mind that we're not really building around this spell in this case, right? So we're not gonna be bumping our charisma for the foreseeable future. So our spell save DC is never going to be fantastic. And it does take an action to cast this as well, meaning that we can't cast this and make attacks in the same turn without grabbing either like quicken spell from sorcerers or action surge from fighters. So great potential here. I'm not going to assume that we're using this, however, when we crunch the numbers. And then at level six, we get Aura of Protection. And I know I usually do stupid things in the name of bumping our damage, and Aura of Protection doesn't technically do that. Anyone else noticing a theme here? The thing is, admittedly, I feel like I have the luxury of doing these kind of things with this build, um, because just wait until you see how much damage we're doing. Anyway, I just, I couldn't live with myself if I delayed taking Aura of Protection. It's hands down one of the best features of any class in the entire game. And again, especially as we don't have constitution saving throw proficiency and therefore a bonus to our concentration checks, you just, you really need to take this, even though there is some multi-classing that I would like to get to. The way Aura of Protection works, of course, is you get to add your charisma modifier to all of your saving throws, and so do all of your allies that are within 10 feet of you. This makes me extra happy that we managed to start off with a 16 charisma, because now we have a plus three to every single saving throw, and that's just so good. And this plus bless makes us and all of our friends who stay close to us just godlike on our saving throws. So at level six, it is time for our first damage report. And you know, it's pretty straightforward. On round one, or before combat begins, if possible, you cast Bless on yourself, and two or three, if you upcast it, uh, of your best friends. And then as a bonus action, you would use Vow of Enmity on the poor sap who has made the massive mistake of pissing you off. On round two, you walk up to them and thus blow them. You hit two attacks with a sharp end, one with your butt action, and you turn on Great Weapon Master for the extra 10 damage on every hit, including on the butt action attack. Just because it's a butt doesn't mean it doesn't also qualify as a heavy weapon. It's super thick. 
You add your three damage from your strength modifier on every hit as well, of course, and then you smite. Right now you have two second level spells that do 3d8 damage each, and then four first level spells that would smite for 2d8 each. Of course, you're using one of those for bless, right? Assuming that all of your attacks land, and with both advantage and bless active, you've got a pretty decent chance of that happening, even with a minus five to hit. That is a total of 2d10 plus 8d8 plus 1d4 plus 39. And so against an enemy with a 10 armor class, you would do on that one round 88 damage on average. And against an enemy with a 15 armor class, you would do 67 damage on average. Woo-wee. Now, with our low strength score, even though we have Bless, we actually would want to turn off Great Weapon Master at a 17 armor class or higher. And so, yes, the damage does fall off rather quickly as the enemy armor class rises. But dang, if you are landing all of those hits, stuff is just blowing up. It's among the more potent of the Nova builds that I've done to date. Again, for those who don't know, check in the video description. I put a graph and a spreadsheet that kind of compares the, the different Nova builds to, to one another. And with Vengeance Paladin, it just continues to get better throughout your career. Now, the one big downside here, of course, and this is also a problem that really persists throughout this character's career, is that while you can do a ton of damage in a single round if you wanted to, if you were to go all out like this, you would be burning up almost all of your spell slots in a single round of combat, which means that you could really only do this level of damage once per day. So I'm not necessarily recommending that you do this in combat, right? As always, we're just exploring what's possible. Exercise as much discretion as you want. And so at level seven, with Aura of Protection in the bag, as well as extra attack and second level spell slots, I think we could afford ourselves a very small detour here. I want some fighter levels because taking them is going to start to launch our Nova damage like into the stratosphere. So you might want to think about why your I will I have, have justice. justice character is now pausing in their development to focus a little more heavily on their martial capabilities. It's not too far a stretch, of course, thematically, as paladins are already sort of a mix between fighters and clerics, right? But I would think about it regardless, especially when we get to our subclass. So at level seven, we are a fighter one, and we get the second wind ability, which tells us that uh, once per short rest, as a bonus action, we can heal ourselves for 1d10 plus our fighter levels, which is a nice little survivability benefit. And then we also get a fighting style. We could pick up Great Weapon Master fighting style here if we really wanted to, but I'm actually going to recommend, again, uh, skipping Great Weapon Master and going this time with superior technique. I love this fighting style as it lets us learn one Battlemaster maneuver from the Battlemaster subclass and then gives us one superiority die to spend on that maneuver once per short rest. This superiority die is only a, a d6 as opposed to the d8 that Battlemasters typically get. And yeah, it is only once per short rest, but those maneuvers can be really powerful. The one that I would recommend taking is the one that I usually recommend taking when we're talking battle masters and maneuvers, and that's trip attack. It's, it's my favorite because it lets us, when we hit with a weapon attack, if the creature is large or smaller, force them to make a strength saving throw, and our DC is based on our dexterity or strength, our choice, or they are knocked prone. Now, I'm not actually going to assume that we are using this on our Nova round. Prone is fantastic, obviously, because as a melee character, if we're making attacks against a prone creature, then we have advantage. As a Vengeance Paladin, on our Nova round, we already have advantage. And even though when we successfully make the trip attack, we get to add that d6 of damage, so yes, potentially we could add a little more damage to our Nova round, I would assume that you would save that maneuver, that superiority die, for a round of combat where you've already used your Vow of Enmity. Having a guaranteed advantage on your attacks twice per short rest instead of once is great. And, and lets us kind of do some really nice burst damage a couple of times per rest, as opposed to just blowing everything on one glorious round 
per day, right? So it just gives us some options. At level eight, we are a fighter two. And of course, you know it, you love it. We get action surge. Once per short rest, you can action surge on your turn, granting you a second full action for that turn. You don't get an extra bonus action, but you do get an extra full action. And so, yes, if you take the attack action and you normally get two attacks when you take the attack action because you have extra attack like we do, then yes, when you action surge, you can take two more attacks. And there's no reason why you couldn't smite on every single one so long as you had the spell slots to do it. At level nine, we are a fighter three and we get our martial archetype, our fighter subclass. At this point in our character's career, something weird is happening. <laughs> If you're playing with the Wild Amount book, the Critical Role book, or in that setting, you might need to figure out at this point what connection, if any, your character may have with the Kryn dynasty. If you're not in that setting, I think I would flavor what's going on here as maybe something like this. The ghosts of, of the victims that you are seeking to avenge have deemed you a worthy champion and so have decided to join you in your cause as you seek justice. And now they manifest themselves occasionally in your fight to lend you aid. Or alternatively, and maybe a little more darkly, perhaps your character has been so hellbent on vengeance that it's actually like harming your own psyche or your soul, causing like strain and maybe even a rift. Perhaps there's a part of you that knows that in order to truly heal from whatever that catastrophe was, you have to learn to forgive and move on. But the other part of you resists that notion and is devoted to the cause of vengeance. And this rift or division, this internal struggle is actually starting to like manifest itself in the physical realm as a shadow or an echo of yourself. Because yes, regardless of your reasons, we are taking Echo Knight as our martial archetype here. I'm not going to read the little blurb because I did that somewhat recently, but Echo Knights are really strong. They get a couple of really fantastic features here right at level three. Um, manifest Echo, which tells us that as a bonus action, you can manifest an echo of yourself within 15 feet. It has an armor class of 14 plus your proficiency bonus, which is 18 for now. And by the way, assuming that we have plate mail armor at this point, our armor class is a 19, thanks to our defense fighting style. Uh, not amazing, but not bad. This echo is immune to all conditions. It uses your saving throw bonus for any saves that it has to make, and that's really good thanks to our of protection, right? And bless. You can mentally command it to move up to 30 feet on your turn, no resource required by you to do that. But if it gets more than 30 feet away from you, it's destroyed. And of course, if it takes one hit point in damage, it's destroyed. But there is no limit to the number of times that you can resummon it, it just takes a bonus action to do so. You can use your echo in many wonderful ways. Bob, tell us what they are. Well, first of all, as a bonus action, you can swap places with your echo, which costs 15 feet of your move speed. Ooh, that's nice. What else? When you attack, you can choose if it comes from you or your echo on each attack. Ooh, that's nice too. What else? When an enemy moves away from it, the echo can make an opportunity attack using your reaction as though you were in the echo space. Ooh, that's nice too. What else? Well, most importantly, we get Unleash Incarnation, which tells us that constitution modifier times per day, that's a bummer. Yes, but whenever you take the attack action, you can make one extra attack from the Echo's position. What? So yes, this is really strong, especially for those of us who are taking the attack action multiple times. Because yes, we can potentially take the attack action, make our two attacks, use Unleash Incarnation to get three, and then Action Surge, make two more attacks, and because we took the attack action, get an extra attack with Unleash Incarnation from our Echo's position. Now again, this is usable constitution modifier times per day, so that's only two for us right now. But at least during our Nova round, we could potentially gain two more attacks now, thanks to this ability. And so, for our damage report here, we have kind of started to enter ludicrous mode. So, our round one setup is the same. We bless and then use Vow of Enmity, but now on round two, we could potentially walk up to our poor sap of an enemy, position our echo so that it's within reach as well, and then hit them with three attacks from the pointy end, thanks to Unleash Incarnation, an extra attack, adding Smite, 
and a d10 from Great Weapon Master on every hit, plus our strength modifier, and then action surge and hit them for three more attacks with add-ons, and then give them some butt action for a little extra love as well. That's seven attacks in a single turn, all with insane damage applications should we choose to use them at level nine. We don't even have the spell slots to cover each one of those attacks if they all land. Now, the likelihood of them all landing is very slim, so we probably will have a smite available for every hit that we make. And so, just for fun, let's pretend that we are blowing a smite on every single attack that we land in this one round. Again, I'm not suggesting that you do this necessarily, just exploring what's possible. We're using one spell for bless and then the other five for smite, potentially. So against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would potentially do 188 damage on average. And against an enemy with a 16 armor class, it's 144. What? <laughs> that outdoes every Nova damage build that I've done to date, except the Evoker Wizard, who was doing their total damage in an area to three enemies. Evoker Wizard there. And the Critlander, who was only doing that level of damage against humanoids, right? Because they were casting Hold Person. Now, again, this is only doable once per long rest. That level of damage, right? So the reality is, you are rarely, I think, going to be blowing all of your spell slots to achieve that level of damage, right? Right? Come on, dude. Be reasonable. Do it. Do it. Reasonable sucks. All right, so from this point, there are so many things that I want with this character. I mean, what is a person hell-bent on exacting vengeance to do? Getting our strength score up as soon as possible is incredibly important for us. We're still languishing at a 16, right? Getting more spell slots so that we can smite more is really important, and higher spell slots too, right? So that we can both smite more often and for more damage. The quickest way to do that, and the thing that I usually do when I'm building a paladin focused on smiting, is to take some bard or sorcerer levels at this point, as they are the charisma-based full casters who gain spell slots so much quicker than paladins. And yet, as I said at the beginning, th there are so many ways that we can benefit by just sticking with paladin and oath of vengeance. It's just the character path that keeps on giving. And so, I think for that reason, it actually makes the most sense to just go back to Paladin here and stay with it for the rest of our career. I know, I'm shocked too. Of course, if you wanted to go with say like a Whispers Bard, I think, or a Sword Bard for a little more burst and you know, those better, quicker spell slots, or maybe like a Divine Soul Sorcerer here for meta magic and spell slots, I think it would be a totally valid choice. Staying with Paladin is, I think, the best way to sort of have our cake and eat it too. We, we are going to get more and higher level spell slots, albeit more slowly, but then also get our strength up a lot quicker this way. And of course, the other paladin features that we pick up that the bard and sorcerer just don't get. But before we do that, let's take one last level in fighter so that we can pick up that ability score increase because it's just right there. And we really want to get our strength up as soon as possible, right? So yes, at level 10, I'm gonna say we go fighter four, um, that we bump our strength so that we're at least at an 18 strength now. You know, with that minus five to hit penalty from Great Weapon Master especially, getting every single bonus to hit that we can goes a long way and I don't wanna delay this any further. But at level 11, we are going back to Paladin. So we're gonna be a Paladin level seven and we get the Relentless Avenger feature from Vengeance Pallies. And, and this is actually the first and I think last, arguably, time that as a Vengeance Paladin, we get a feat that isn't that great. It tells us that when we hit a creature with an opportunity attack, and remember, we can do this when a creature first enters our space as well as leaves it, right? Thanks to Polearm Master. You can move up to half of your speed as part of that reaction, and that movement doesn't provoke opportunity attacks. Uh, I mean, there will be times where this will be kind of handy and, or fun. Um, maybe you can kind of kite an enemy with this or, or move over to help out an ally or something. But most of the time, I just don't see us getting a ton of use out of this personally. And then at level 12, we would be a paladin level eight, and we get an ability score increase or feat. And I'm going to recommend that we bump our constitution here. <laughs> Wait, what? Didn't you just tell us how important it was to get our strength score up? I did. And it is. 
but very soon having a plus three constitution modifier is going to be even more important as we will see so just hang tight and of course getting more hit points and a bump to our constitution saving throw and concentration checks is not bad either but at level 13 we would be paladin level 9 and we get third level paladin spells so in addition to being able to smite for 4d8 now potentially with those third level spell slots we get as a vengeance paladin both protection from energy as an oath spell um, that's situationally useful defensively but more importantly for us haste this is a spell that is not accessible to most paladins and it was one of the reasons why i wanted to go back to paladin we could have gotten to haste with say a sorcerer dip or even a lore bard but it would have taken a few more levels to get there and i want this spell sooner rather than later haste is amazing and when you have lots of ways to add damage to your attacks like we do it's even more amazing so with haste you cast it as an action, it uses your concentration, more on that in a sec, but thereafter, for one minute, you have a plus two to your armor class, which is awesome. Your move speed is doubled, and actually there's potentially some fun interaction now here, I think, with our new Relentless Avenger ability, because we can move so much further. It would really let us, when we take an opportunity attack, really get a lot of movement as part of that reaction that's cool we have advantage on dexterity saving throws which is nice since it's a pretty common save that we would need and our dexterity is not very good although our deck saves aren't terrible thanks to aura of protection most importantly it gives us an additional action that can only be used to dash disengage hide use an object or take the attack action Although, if we take the attack action with haste, we only get one more attack, not two, even though we have extra attack, right? That said, we are still taking the attack action, a third, yes, third, if we're using action surge, attack action on our turn. And remember what that means for us as an Echo Knight, right? When we take the attack action, we can make an additional melee attack from our Echo's position. So as an Echo Knight here with the haste spell, even though we only are supposed to get one extra attack when we take the attack action from haste, we would actually get two extra attacks thanks to our Echo Knight if we had a use of our Unleash Incarnation still available to us. And remember, we only get to do that a number of times per day equal to our Constitution modifier. And so, yeah, that's the reason why I wanted to bump Constitution last level, so that we could have three uses per day. And so now casting haste on ourselves can potentially grant us two more attacks during our Nova round. And when you crunch the numbers, that's better than taking a plus one to strength would have been last level. Some of you might be asking if we shouldn't be using Spirit Shroud here for our concentration instead, as that would add a d8 to all of our attacks, and it is available to all paladins. It's not a bad option. If we weren't an Echo Knight, the math between Haste and Spirit Shroud is almost identical. But with that extra attack that an Echo Knight would potentially get from Haste, it takes a fairly solid lead numbers-wise over Spirit Shroud. Not to mention, of course, the increase to move speed, the increase to your armor class that Haste gives us. Of course, there's a big downside to Haste that I'm not mentioning, that is when the spell ends, you have to spend a turn doing nothing. And that could happen if you just lose concentration on the spell, and that could potentially be devastating. Another strike, though, against Spirit Shroud in this comparison here actually is that it costs a bonus action to cast, which you would think would be a good thing, right? But since our Vow of Enmity is also a bonus action, it means that we wouldn't be going full speed on our Nova until we had two rounds of prep, because you can only ever use one bonus action per turn. And, and that stinks. That's actually, that's, a, that's, a, that's one thing that I really don't like about 5th edition, that you can't use a bonus action as an action should you choose to. But anyway, that's an argument for another time. As for Bless, it absolutely still has its place, no question. At a higher enemy armor class, like about 20 AC or up, you're actually still probably better off with Bless, because that plus d4 to hit on every single swing ends up being more valuable when the enemy gets harder to hit and you're hitting for so much not to mention of course that it's only a first level spell potentially allowing you to save that third level spell slot for a bigger smite or something else of course and that it bumps all of your saving throws which is big 
And most importantly, it gives those same benefits to your allies. I'm sure that, depending on your allies, Bless probably is going to put out more overall damage for your entire party than taking haste selfishly would here. But I don't know what your party looks like. I don't know if your teammates are doing lots of damage. And I'm trying, as I usually do, to make this build sort of like as self-sufficient as possible. So yes, when I crunch the numbers from here on out, I'm going to assume that we've got haste going here. As for the other third level spells that you might want to consider, knock yourself out. I mean, there are some great ones. I would I would probably make sure to at least get Revivify, which is like the first resurrection type spell that you have access to, just in case one of your friends dies and no one else can bring them back. And I guess they're not a total jerk and you actually want to bring them back. <laughs> And so, for a damage report at level 13, we have again had some really nice bumps. Um, this, this build just does not plateau. Our strength modifier is increased by one. We get an eighth and ninth attack now on our Nova round from haste plus unleash incarnation. And we've gained some additional and better spell slots up to a third level spell slot, of course, although we're using one of them for the haste spell, right? So if on the crazy off chance that we actually wanted to burn haste round one and use vow of enmity as a bonus action, and then all of our other spell slots, for smiting against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would do 287 damage on average. And against an enemy with a 17 armor class, it would still be over 200. It's 201 on average. Now, assuming that you are not using a magic weapon that gives you a bonus to hit and like that you don't have an ally that's maybe using a bless spell of their own on you or, or some other buff to add to your plus to hit you would turn off the great weapon master feature at an 18 enemy armor class but i'm sure that most of us by this level would have some additional increases to our hit chance, at least from like a plus one weapon or something, right? And, and I'm not calculating any of that in here. So any additional plus to hit would of course push that turn off great weapon master at this armor class number a little bit higher. And by the way, when you look at the spreadsheet, for those who don't know, you can see that number. I always highlight it in yellow, the ar enemy armor class, at which point you should turn off Great Weapon Master or Sharpshooter if I use Sharpshooter in the build. Anyway, yes, we are still among the top Nova Damage dealers of any build that I've created and with a lot fewer caveats to achieving that level of damage. All right, at level 14, we are a Paladin 10, and we get Aura of Courage, which tells us that you and your allies within 10 feet of you cannot be frightened, and this will be amazing when you need it and worthless otherwise, but, you know, having immunity to a somewhat common and fairly painful condition is pretty fantastic. At level 15, we would be a Paladin 11, and we get improved Divine Smite. And again, between like the Vengeance subclass and just the Paladin base chassis, this path just keeps on giving. I mean, after we hit Paladin 9, which I wanted for haste, even though I would have loved to go like Barter Sorcerer for more and better spell slots, I couldn't imagine not just taking two more Paladin levels here to get Improved Divine Smite as it gives all of our melee weapon attacks an extra 1d8 of radiant damage on top of whatever else we're doing. This is like a free Spirit Shroud spell that's just always on all the time. I mean, this would be strong on any Paladin. For someone who's potentially making nine attacks in a single turn, it's insanely strong. And it's also nice to have this bump for our non-Nova rounds, right? It really helps out our sustained damage per round as well, of course. Now, at level 16, we would be a Paladin 12, and we do get another ability score increase or feat. Admittedly, part of me would love to bump Charisma here to just give us a stronger aura of protection, among other things, you know, a better uh, Paladin spell save DC, but I, we just have to have a 20 strength. In fact, this might be the longest that I've ever delayed getting a character's main stat 220 before for a character that's focused on damage. It feels bad. But... At every step of the way, the numbers just indicated that we're better off delaying it for something else. So here we are. And then finally, for us anyway, at level 17, we would be a Paladin level 13. Finally getting fourth level Paladin spells feels really nice so that we can 
at least smite for 5d8 once per day if we want to, but there are fantastic spell options otherwise that you might rather spend that spell slot on, right? The oath spells, again, are both particularly strong. Banishment is a super strong control spell. Again, just keep in mind that our spell DC is not amazing with a 16 charisma, but then we also get Dimension Door as an oath spell, which is like the ultimate in combat teleportation for both you and your friend. Aside from those, I would say, like, I mean, you gotta get Find Greater Steed, right? Because, I mean, griffins. But other than that, pick your favorites. And so for our final damage report, we've added a bit from some higher level spell slots, as well as, of course, an additional 1d8 of damage for Divine Smite on every single hit. And finally, we have capped our strength score. Thus, against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would be doing, on average, 394 damage. And against an enemy with an 18 armor class, we would be doing 288 damage in a single round. Gee, who's a fat trigger? We were this close to breaking the 400 mark. We're still very much in the like top echelon when compared to other Nova builds. But again, without all of the, this only works if caveats that, that some of them have while simultaneously having a lot more like defensive utility and support uh, features than the other Nova damage builds that do this much damage have. And so, final thoughts. I mean, the reality is this level of damage a lot of the times is just gonna be overkill, right? How often are you going to need to do 300 plus, almost 400 damage against a single enemy in a single turn? Sometimes, sure, but not that often. Of course, you could always take out one enemy and then move over to take out a second or even third in that single glorious Nova round, but I'm actually okay with the overkill because like I've been saying, Burning through all of your spell slots in one glorious round of burst damage is probably something that you're not actually going to want to do all that often. So feel free to scale it back a bit, but still totally wreck things in relative moderation. I really love how deep we went into the Paladin class with this build. I, I almost never get this far with my Paladins. And maybe not since like my Paladin tank build? How many cards do I have left? Or I guess my maybe my Necromancer Oathbreaker, which was like two characters, right? But one of them was the Oathbreaker Paladin that I just, I don't think I multiclassed them at all. Regardless, there is a ton of additional utility and defensive capabilities that you get at later Paladin levels that makes this character feel super valuable for reasons more than just offensively. I mean, your Lay on Hands is really potent. Immunity to fear for you and your friends? Fantastic. But what's so fantastic, especially about the Oath of Vengeance Paladin, is that you get to have those great utility and defensive buffs, and also pour out some absolutely insane damage on demand. And that is my favorite thing about this character, I think. It's, again, it's, it's just the ultimate in having your cake and eating it too. Now, I did mention at the beginning that I was going to briefly talk about an alternative path for this build that was focused on using the double-bladed scimitar instead of a polearm, right? So let me go over that just quickly. Basically, you go with a dexterity focus instead of strength, and you start as either an elf or a half-elf. You probably eventually are going to want to take the revenant blade feat so that the double-bladed scimitar can count as a finesse weapon, and also the elven accuracy feat, so that you can have that triple advantage that you get from elven accuracy, right? And you can't benefit from elven accuracy if you're making strength-based attacks, so getting your double-bladed scimitar to be a finesse weapon is important. Using the double-bladed scimitar is nice because it lets you add the damage bonus from your dexterity modifier to the bonus action attack that you get to make with your double-bladed scimitar without having to take the two-weapon fighting style. With this build, you don't start with a free feat, so at level four, you would take elven accuracy, I think, and then at level eight, you would would take Revenant Blade. The big problem with this is that, generally speaking, you're much weaker until you can get both of those feats, which wouldn't happen until level 8 at the earliest, meaning you also delay your fighter levels because you want to go all the way to Paladin 8, I think, before you start multiclassing. And so then your extra attacks, your action surges, your Echo Knight features, you wouldn't have until like character level 11. And frankly, by that point, a lot of campaigns are going to be over, right? Or at least will be shortly. 
Now, you don't have to go double-bladed scimitar. You could do short swords and be almost as good as you will be once you get that double-bladed scimitar. But still, that's kind of the, the pinnacle of the build, I suppose. You know, I just, I don't love delaying my character's power until like character level eight. That just feels really bad to me. Not that you wouldn't still be strong. And so it is a viable path, no question. You also, of course, the double-bladed scimitar is not a heavy weapon, meaning you would not be able to take advantage of Great Weapon Master and, and the additional damage that that's going to bring. But that actually is compensated for by the increased critical rate that you would get with Elven Accuracy and being able to roll 3d20s, essentially, when you have advantage. And so we don't mind missing out on Great Weapon Master that much. I think, you know, if I were playing at a table where I got to start with a free feat, or I were playing a character that started at level eight or higher, I would probably go this route with my Vengeance Pally. And then, you know, once you hit those higher character levels, you do see even more damage than what I presented. So for what it's worth, at level 17, the damage from this build would be slightly better at a low enemy armor class. You would break the 400 mark with 402 at an enemy armor class of 10 and much, much better at a high enemy armor class. It would be 341 at an enemy AC of uh, 18. So anyway, for what it's worth, that's the dexterity-based Vengeance Paladin build. But regardless, thanks for watching. I love you guys so much. I really appreciate um, your support. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope that you'll check out the other content on the channel and uh, like and subscribe and join and all of those things if you haven't already done so. So anyway, have a fantastic day. I hope to see you again very soon, and until then, take care. Blah, blah, blah. So we can... Blah, blah, blah. The, the bless spell is fantastic. <sighs> <laughs> which means that they have disadvantage on attack rolls and saving throws <sighs> or or at least would or at least on in one particular <sighs>